Welcome to the Who, What, Why podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Sheckman. The Ukrainian counteroffensive has begun and the world holds its breath. Will independence prevail? Will democracy survive? Sometimes even life and death events need the context of fantasy to bring them into bold relief. In the modern day saga, Russia, a global powerhouse, has sought to erase the independence that Ukraine, much like the fictional Duchy of Grand Fedwick, had painstakingly carved out for itself. As the war began, the world watched with a sense of impending doom, as the vast disparities in size and strength between the two nations seemed to spell out a clear outcome. But much like the Duchy, Ukraine, the underdog in this fight, has been surprising everyone with its tenacity and resilience. The narrative that was originally painted was one of inevitable defeat for Ukraine. But as we've seen in The Mouse That Roared, the underdog can surprise us. Ukraine has defied expectations, successfully thwarting Russia's attempted land grabs. The war has been seen, as we have discussed here previously, as a military deadlock, likely to end with a negotiated settlement far short of each side's original goals. But Ukraine's remarkable ability to wage war and to transfer Western military support into battlefield success suggests that a stalemate is not inevitable. What if Ukraine really can succeed in pushing Russian forces back to its internationally recognized borders? This would not only liberate Ukraine, but also establish a solid foundation for security. But what are the real potential outcomes of this conflict? Can we draw parallels with the Yom Kippur War and the Korean War? And what's the future of democracy in Ukraine, really the war's second front and a struggle that will continue long after the guns are silent? This war is a story of resilience, of the human spirit, and of a nation's fight for its right to exist. Much like the Duchy of Grand Fenwick, Ukraine is proving that even the smallest mouse can roar. We're going to talk about this today with my guest, Gideon Rose. He's the former editor of Foreign Affairs, a member of the Council on Foreign Relations, and served as associate director for Near East and South Asian Affairs on the National Security Council in the Clinton administration. He is currently the Mary and David Boys Distinguished Fellow in U.S. Foreign Policy at the Council on Foreign Relations and the author of the previous book, How Wars End, Why We Always Fight the Last Battle. It is my pleasure to welcome Gideon Rose back to the Who, What, Why podcast. Gideon, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Well, it is a delight to have you here. In your current article in, in Foreign Affairs, you talk about that we need to start thinking about the possibility that Ukraine can win this war, which is a different mindset than I think people have been talking about for a while. Talk about that in a general sense first. So one of the fascinating things about war in general is that you don't know what's going to happen until things actually happen. And this war in particular has been surprising on a variety of fronts. Very, very few people expected Russia to attack as aggressively and uh, uh, completely as it did. The U.S. government was picking up signals on troop movements and actually called it the intelligence communities. But very few people, including until very late in the game, the Ukrainians themselves believed that Russia would try to conquer the entire country uh, and eliminate its dependence. Once the attack was launched, very few people believed that the Ukrainians had a chance. It seemed that the disparities in strength between the two sides was such that the Russians would just roll over, that it would be a tragedy, uh, roll over the Ukrainians and take the country, that it would be a tragedy, but that the heroic uh, defenders would be overcome. And what happened yet again was a surprise, which is the Ukrainians performed better than anybody expected and the Russians performed worse than people expected. And very gradually, the Ukrainians fought off the initial attacks. They pushed the Russians back. They prevented the Russians from consolidating their gains in the east. Last fall, they managed to take back territory in the Kharkiv region. They pushed the Russians out of Kherson. Um, the Russians launched uh, a big offensive in the spring with lots of in the winter with lots of new troops they had mobilized and with uh, prison conscripts that they sent uh, through uh, their the Wagner organization. Um, but the Ukrainians managed to hold the line. And now we're in and the Ukrainians managed to uh, survive a punishing 
air attack on their civilian infrastructure and their air defenses um, and and the across the country. And so now we have a situation in which the Ukrainians are launching their latest counteroffensive to push back uh, the Russians and take even more territory and perhaps even threaten areas like Crimea, which were uh, taken not in this uh, phase of the war, but back in 2014. So it's a very surprising and fluid atmosphere in which anybody who is dogmatic about what has happened or can happen is probably going to be proven wrong. Very, very few people have called this one consistently correct. And in that situation, what I've tried to do as I've watched the conflict and as I've visited Ukraine a couple of times and as I've talked to people is to update my analyses based on the facts that I'm seeing. I'm try I like to think of myself as an empiricist and I'm trying to basically update my uh, judgments about what is happening and what can happen based on what I'm seeing. Are there specific things that you can point to that, that lead you to these conclusions? Four things have convinced me that the possibilities for Ukrainian victory are higher than people thought. The first is that the, the Russians have underperformed consistently. Uh, they've just been terrible throughout this war militarily. They they are fighting like the old Soviets. I, I mentioned in the piece that they're fighting like the Arab armies back in the, you know, the in 67 and 73, not quite that badly. But essentially, they have a lot more people and a lot more weaponry, uh, but they don't know how to use it effectively. It's kind of a lot of brute force um, and uh, uh, unimaginative tactics uh, that that hasn't turned their potential power into actual outcomes. The Ukrainians, on the other hand, have been extraordinarily impressive in using whatever resources they have at hand uh, to do uh, much better than anybody expected. Early in the war, it was, you know, civilians using drones and handmade Molotov cocktails to, you know, take on Russian tanks. And increasingly, as they've gotten more sophisticated weapons from, you know, Stinger missiles to the HIMARS artillery to the Patriot anti-missile, you know, and air defense systems and other kinds of uh, weaponry, they've managed to do ever better and use whatever uh, they've been given and turned it effectively into outcomes. A lot of wars involve the transfer of military aid. We gave lots and lots of aid to the Afghans. We gave lots and lots of support to the Iraqis. We gave lots and lots of support to the Vietnamese. Um, And in all those conflicts, all that aid didn't really achieve that much. What's striking to me about Ukraine is not just the heroism of the defenders, is not just the righteousness of their cause, not just the nastiness of the people attacking, but the extent to which there has been an excellent return, as it were, on the investment that the Western powers have uh, made in Ukraine, because whatever we're giving them, they're turning around and using effectively to defeat the Russians on the battlefield. And I, in effect, am betting that that will continue to happen. Um, Another thing that has uh, uh, changed my mind, well, that hasn't changed my mind. I call early on, I decided that there was probably much less risk of nuclear escalation than many uh, felt, not because it was hypothetically impossible, uh, but because nuclear weapons are lousy at actual war fighting. They're good to threaten with, but they're so strong and powerful and so indiscriminate that it they're not really good at doing things. It's like trying to fish with a, a, a grenade. You know, you, 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 you don't really get a targeted result. You destroy the entire environment around you kind of thing. And since the Russians are in since this war involves close in fighting on territory right next to Russia that the Russians themselves are claiming to liberate and the populations there rather than uh, uh, conquer, uh, it is not at all clear to me that there would be any gain made by actually using nuclear weapons. And there would be a lot of costs. And so I early on argued that the Russian red lines supposedly were bluffs rather than um, uh, actual uh, promises of nuclear use. And 
everything that's happened over the course of the war has convinced me that I was right on that. In other words, that we've blown through all sorts of Russian red lines and they haven't responded with escalation. And I and again, I don't think it's because they're holding back. It's be, I think it's because that was always something of a bluff. Um, and and finally, there's when I, when I've been to Ukraine, there's been this indomitable will that uh, you see in the Ukrainians. Um, much of my adult career has been watching the United States fight in various wars with local partners in which we have triggered nationalism on the other side. And we have been seen as an outside invader, as the sort of uh, the, the person who's causing the problem. Even if we didn't think that was the case, a lot of the locals felt that way, whether in Afghanistan or in Iraq, uh, et cetera. And in Ukraine, what's amazing is when you go there, there's nationalism on our side this time. Uh, and there is the will of the underdog on our side this time. And there is the uh, sense that we have a patriotic cause to, to, to fight back and take our country. And the extent to which that is motivating differential performance among the troops involved uh, is, is really astonishing to me. Um, the Russians are not bad soldiers, but this is not their fight. They don't have a particular take in it. It was a one man's war. It was Putin's uh, desire to do this. Um, and he didn't even tell the troops and the soldiers. He just sort of sent them into battle. Most recently, you've had uh, prisoners who are basically offered a pardon if they'll risk, if they can, you know, get out of jail free, try to survive an attack. And if you survive uh, being cannon fodder, you'll be free afterwards. That's what was happening in Bakhmut. Um, and those are, you know, those troops may have a little bit of desperation in the short run to save their skins, but they're not doing this because of ideological belief in the cause. Whereas the Ukrainians are fighting to take back their own territory, to avenge their their fathers, to liberate their mothers, to uh, uh, everybody has been affected by this war. Um, they know that it really is existential for them. In Russia, it's about a dream of a past empire being regained. In Ukraine, it's about life or death as a sovereign country. And that's an incredibly powerful motivator. And that combined with the skill of the Ukrainian leadership and and troops has changed my mind as to what is possible. I was always in favor of supporting Ukraine and helping it defend against the attack. I, earlier in the war, I thought the most that could probably be gained uh, was the status quo anti lines in February 2022, in other words, at the beginning of this war. But the more it's gone on and the more I've watched it, I've come to think that it is both necessary and possible to shoot not just for the 2022 lines, but the 2014 lines, the 1991 original recognized borders. Because if you could do that, if you could get to that point, you would have restored international order. You'd have essentially shown that aggression doesn't pay. And if you could hold, if you could reach and hold those lines, then uh, you'd have a solid foundation for regional and global security, just as happened in Korea, uh, just as happened in uh, Kuwait. Uh, you would have pushed back an invader, restored sovereign borders, and sent the message that aggression doesn't pay. And I now think however costly and however difficult, that is a possible outcome and that that would be the best outcome to shoot for. And does that outcome take place entirely on the battlefield or is it the strength of the Ukrainians and the success of the Ukrainians on the battlefield that leads to some kind of negotiated settlement that enforces those lines? So it's a great question. And the answer is it's both, right? Which is you don't... Uh, you can control some things, but not others. And war is ultimately political and it's ultimately a matter of choice. And so the war won't fully end until the Russians decide to end it. Uh, and they can always hypothetically keep trying to attack. Uh, but the way to affect their decision calculus is to present them with a military fait accompli and, uh, and eventually make them realize you cannot achieve your goals and trying to continue doing so will be ever 
more costly for you. And so just give up. And I think that the uh, if you mount a credible threat to push the Russians all the way back uh, to their borders, uh, two things can happen. The first is the very fact of the threat. If you de- let's say let's say this current offensive, this current offensive isn't going to end the war. It's not going to take back all the territory. But uh, what it could do is leave the Ukrainians in a position that is further along than they were at the beginning of the offensive and in a position to shell and threaten and pressure the remaining Russian-held areas of Ukraine, whether it's anything they might still have in the Donbass in the east, whether it's Ukraine, uh, Crimea in the south. So if the Ukrainians can get to a point where they take back some territory and put themselves in a position to threaten the remaining Russian territory, that puts the Russians in a dilemma. They have a choice. They can continue fighting or they could try at that point, if you were a sane government in Moscow and you realize, gee, we bet on this, but it didn't work. Now it's time to cut our losses and trade our remaining military capacity, our remaining positions for some kind of negotiated settlement uh, that allowed us to achieve something. Um, So, for example, in 1973, the Egyptians attacked along with the Syrians. They attacked Israel and the Israelis had a close call for a while. But with American help, they were able to resupply themselves and push the invaders back. And they managed to go all the way to the Suez Canal and and encircle uh, the Egyptian Third Army. Uh, threatening a complete and total annihilation of Egyptian forces. And that created a situation in which the U.S. then jumped in and said, "Okay, now we have a ceasefire and now we can trade, in effect, the we'll help the Egyptian army escape and we'll even promise that they can get back some of their land in return for um, negotiations for an ongoing settlement. And, you know, so a ceasefire segues to negotiations over a longer regional settlement, which ultimately produces Camp David and ultimately produces the bedrock of Middle Eastern security, which is the Egyptians and the Israelis are not going to fight each other anymore. For all the ongoing things going on, you don't expect the Egyptians and Israelis to fight. So it's conceivable. I'm not saying it's probable, but it's conceivable that if you put the Russians in that situation, threatened them with military catastrophe in Crimea, let's say, you could get a situation in which they traded off uh, that in return for going back to something like, oh, the situation prior to 2014, in which there was uh, the Ukrainians and the Russians both used the naval base at Sevastopol. The Russians had a Black Sea fleet that, sea fleet that was based there, um, but they weren't directly threatening Ukraine. So that could be possible. Um, But even if that's not what's possible, you could then go to what I call the Korea analogy in which you fight your way back to the starting lines. And then you say, look, we are going to hold this indefinitely until you agree to give up. Uh, In 1951, after a year of warfare, uh, the UN forces took back, as it were, all of the uh, the territory that the North Koreans had seized. Um, And then they said, look, we want to stop it now, status quo ante. Um, And they kept fighting for a long time for various other issues, but only essentially to defend and protect those lines. And eventually in 1953, you had an armistice that codified those original lines, the lines where the starting you know, the starting lines of the war back in 1950, which remain the division between North Korea and South Korea today, 70 years on, you still have that. And that's a kind of plausible scenario as well. So in my opinion, you you take back uh, the, the Ukrainian territory and you essentially help the Ukrainians guard it the way you've helped the, uh, the, the South Koreans guard the 38th parallel. And then you wait for uh, uh, the Russians to accept that they're never going to get it back. Basically, the root cause of this problem is that Russia feels that it was gypped out of its empire. It feels that it has a right to exert uh, dominance in its region beyond its borders of Russia. And it is prepared to use force to achieve that. And what has to be done for the long term for this problem to be solved is that Russia has to be convinced that is not possible. And so I've reluctantly uh, come to think that helping Ukraine teach Russia that lesson 
is the right course of action. Might this not have been more possible for Ukraine had they had more military equipment earlier? Had had the military equipment that the West has provided not been given out in the kind of piecemeal way that it has? So yes and no. In one sense, yes, which is the West has been supplying Ukraine with enough aid to help it not lose rather than to help it win. Um, and they've been very careful both to the, the, the Biden administration uh, has worried very much about the risks of possible nuclear escalation. So they have wanted they've put a whole bunch of limits on the conflict, um, some of which I agree with and some of which I don't. One they've put in is no involvement of NATO forces directly, which makes total sense. So that some people, for example, um, suggested, oh, you should have a no fly zone. Uh, the problem with that is it creates the risk of actual encounters between NATO forces and Russian forces, which could conceivably get you into a direct war, NATO-Russia war, which could escalate to nuclear stuff. So I agree that indirect rather than direct support for Ukraine makes sense. A second thing that the West has done is they've said to the Ukrainians, you have to limit the uh, the scope of the battlefield, the the extent of it. You can't attack Moscow directly. You can't go into Russia directly. You have to just keep fighting them on your own territory. Now, this seems unfair. And in fact, the Ukrainians have been fudging around the edges of this recently with some drone attacks in Moscow and some little incursions into Russian territory around uh, the areas. But by and large, this war has been confined to Ukraine. And again, I think that is largely sensible, not because it, it wouldn't be good to make the Russians pay and that couldn't change their calculus. But you do want to leave Moscow the 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 sense that it is secure in its regime in the sense that you don't you don't want to create a situation in which they feel they have absolutely nothing to lose and therefore they might as well launch a nuclear strike. And so by saying, look, this war is about Ukraine, not about Russia, uh, it, it, it makes it harder for Ukraine, but it does uh, – ease Russian anxieties enough to make nuclear use uh, even less likely. Um, the third kind of restriction that the West has put on, though, has been on the types of, West, of weapons they've given. They've given Ukraine, in effect, weapons that can be used to defend more than weapons that can be used to attack. Um, now, this is a hard line to draw because, in fact, in modern warfare, especially with things like air defenses and artillery, um, the farther you can push your enemy back, the better. And and so attack and defense are combined. But by and large, um, what the West has not done is given Ukraine the, the absolute best weapons that could uh, the Russians might imagine could be used to invade or attack Russia. And what I'm saying is these, these are the restrictions that we should ease up now. We should give them more conventional weaponry because it's pretty clear, a few drone attacks and other things on Moscow aside, uh, the, that the Ukrainians are acting responsibly in this war and that they are indeed using the weapons to push the Russians back, not to... Um, to go after Moscow. So, for example, the F-16s, there was a lot of talk earlier this year about whether Ukraine should get F-16 planes and other fourth generation, what are called fourth generation fighters. And um, the West has been reluctant to give these because you could you could do a lot of damage with a plane like that. You could you, know, you could potentially attack Moscow or attack Russia or various kinds of things with your advanced fighters and bombers. But the Ukrainians want it not so that they can launch offensive operations, but because the Russians are using m artillery and missiles and uh, attacking platforms on their territory to attack Ukraine. And you need the F-16s and comparable planes to extend the defensive perimeter of Ukraine, as it were, further back into Russian territory to push off the Russian planes and ships and 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 drone bases so that the Ukrainians can can actually um, attack forward on the ground in their own territory. So you're using the F-16s, in effect, as high level air defenses 
to cover the battlefield rather than as weapons that can attack. They could also be used in the future for Ukrainian Air Force to defend against Russia once you have a settlement. And that's a separate question, though. But so I, I, um, the, I think it makes sense to retain the restrictions on the warfare that keep it in the keep Western aid indirect. And I think it's sensible to limit the battlefield to Ukraine. But I do think we should increase the um, uh, the conventional help given because a little bit of extra conventional military aid is not going to trigger, even though the Russians have tried to say, oh, that'll trigger our red lines. Um, I don't think it, it, it will. Um, an interesting paradox of this is however brutal and vicious and, un, and unpleasant the war has been, the limitation of aid may have actually played a role in helping bleed Russia unintentionally, which is that the, the continued surprise of the war in terms of Russian underperformance and Ukrainian overperformance has surprised everybody, including Russia. And so the limitations on aid that the West has enforced may have given Moscow the sense that it could still win if it just kept exerting a little more effort. And so throughout the war, Russia has consistently upped its own game, has had to up its own game and mobilize more and send more forces into battle. And the result has been like the Sicilian expedition in the Peloponnesian War, that what started as a relatively minor attack for Russia has consumed vast amounts of Russian blood and treasure and is already a world historical strategic defeat for Russia. There's no question that this has set Russia back a generation militarily, economically, strategically, um, no matter what happens going forward. And that's in part because the aid that we've doled out incrementally has never been enough to make them think, oh, now we really can't possibly win. But if we were to start increasing the aid now or continue to increase it, um, and if the Ukrainians can continue to push forward, you might have bloodied the Russians enough that they realize, gee, now we just, we've exhausted our, so much of our capabilities that we don't really have any more options in the short term, other than uh, something as dramatic as nuclear stuff, which I don't think they'll do. So I perversely, the limitations on aid, even though they've increased the cost of the war, could have suckered the Russians into devoting more forces than they ever expected and more blood and treasure to what will become one of the uh, historical strategic defeat. And finally, Gideon, bringing it back to the nationalism that you talked about at the beginning, how does the calculus change, if at all, to the extent that this is perceived as some kind of a proxy battle between the U.S. or the U.S. and Europe and Russia? So, you know, it's an interesting question. Uh, the question is perceived by whom? By keeping it limited, by keeping the aid indirect and by keeping uh, the, the, the battlefield limited, even if it is perceived as something as a proxy war in practice, it's got an actual combat become, you know, in Vietnam, in Korea, uh, in, in, in many other conflicts, uh, Afghanistan, the... It, as long as the, the danger in it being a proxy war is that it brings in the outside powers behind it. But there's a lot of evidence over the last 75 years that great powers can fight and give aid to fighting uh, other powers. If you think about if you think about the wars that America has been engaged in in the last generation uh, in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in Vietnam, uh, you you the other side got aid uh, in ways uh, that we didn't like. Um, there were people who were, in effect, we were fighting proxy wars against Russia and China in Korea, often direct conflict in Korea. Um, in in Vietnam, uh, they were they were be, our enemies were being supplied in Afghanistan and Iraq. There were cross border. Uh, aid being given. We're now playing the role of the people on the other side of the border helping somebody resist aggression. And it turns out it's much better to be in that role than it is to be the schmuck who blunders into another country and triggers a nationalistic reaction by trying to take it over. We are Pakistan uh, helping the Taliban. We are uh, uh, the Iranians helping uh, the Iraqis against us. 
Um, and, you know, it, that you could call that a proxy war. But as long as we keep it sort of indirect and just supply weaponry, there's every reason to believe you can get away with it. Gideon Rose, his article, Ukraine's Winnable War, Why the West Should Help Kiev Retake All Its Territory, appears in the current issue of Foreign Affairs. Gideon, I thank you so much for spending time with us here on the Who, What, Why podcast. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. And thank you for listening and joining us here on the Who, What, Why podcast. I hope you join us next week for another Radio Who, What, Why podcast. I'm Jeff Sheckman. If you like this podcast, please feel free to share and help others find it by rating and reviewing it on iTunes. You can also support this podcast and all the work we do by going to whowhatwhy.org forward slash donate.